Now this morning, we, are, we have the pleasure to have Marcus Mert from Vista. He is a project manager, a remote sensing specialist, and uh, in charge of the ESA project, which is the food tap, uh, the food security tap, I mean the thematic exploitation platform for the food security. You have the floor, and he will try to have some interaction with, with your computer as well. You have the floor, Marcus. OK, thank you very much, Pierre. Um, and thank you very much for letting me have this, uh, this lecture. Um, yeah, there's an introduction. OK, there will be the talk about the food security tab or semantic exploitation platform. But on the other hand, it's also quite interesting for me personally to go back to knowledge generation. I switched from university to industry. So I would say from knowledge generation to product generation. Now I can do a little bit step towards this, what I've done in the past. So um, yeah, it's a little bit a mixture of theory and uh, practical things. So that's why we were asked to get the SSO login to be able to, to use the food security platform. And um, of course, it's not only about this one platform. It's about, let's say, about the ESA ecosystem of platforms a bit. So depending on what you do in this training session or probably at home, I also show you that this specific notebook application, it's not a big thing, but that you can run it on food security tab, you can run it on Terrascope of, of Vito, of, of the Belgian community, and um, so on. So this is not only about the food security tab, but about the ESA systems as well. So just as a reminder, but now it's basically too late, because um, I don't know if the colleagues would be in time to give you the, the coins and so on, but I guess I had a lot of uh, emails about this that you have registered both to the SSO, probably just to explain the authentication. <clears throat> I mean, it's wise to have not a single authentication for all ESA platforms, but one common <coughs> authentication system. So this is the EOSSO, and it's there for a long time. It's used for Earthnet and so on and so on. So I think that's quite good for the EO community to have this SSO. But um, later on, I will also talk a little bit about what is probably coming up and um, because it was built a lot a long time ago probably in the future we will have a new <coughs> authentication for all the platforms that will be let's say a little bit modernized and more focused toward cloud services so but this is the reason why you need to do this first and then you're in the this SSO database and then your information is transferred to us at the moment where you actually enter the platform. And this is the same with all platforms. And then you're visible. OK. So this is why often I was asked why I have to do log in twice. But this is the reason, of course. So um, yeah, we'll go a little bit, let's say, to some basics. Because I mean, I'm focused on uh, the cloud platforms ecosystem and about cloud or let's say computing for agricultural applications. So this is my background here in this case as well. So I start with something more generic, the global food system. The global food system, well, I, nobody to really talk about food security as a global problem, but uh, just to see that we have this idea of a balance between supply and demand and this balance between the farming systems and the um, the consumers. This transfers a lot of food, waste, water, energy, and money between these two sides. So of course, it would always be good to see this in a balance in the future and not imbalanced. And uh, what we can, of course, do as a neo community is to see the imprint of this flow. So you have the imprint of food, waste, water, energy, and mo well, money not so much, but through the farmers themselves on the landscape on the Earth's surface, on the atmosphere probably. So and we can sense this and give a meaning to this, to this balance and um, can support politics and governments, of course. But I guess we can also influence social cultural behavior by this. Not everywhere, but potentially in Europe or yeah, in other places. So, and to get this imprint gone, uh, going and also helpful for the farming side especially, it's, of course, important to have, let's say, farming systems, smart systems, 
I mean, now the farming management systems are coming up, and uh, I just know about the German situation, but it's taken up at the moment where all the precision farming uh, machinery is there. Now also the farmers start to use farming management systems that go a bit further on, not just accounting, but also they start to use this to plan their management of, of the crops and so on. Actually, they do right now. I mean, of course, this is slowly growing because of the farming business is a, let's say, slowly changing business, but it does. And of course, the idea is that if there is some public interest in that, that there's also this global smart farm, as it's called here, and this global smart farm will also allow to, to share information between different actors and so allow both, let's say, the small actors and the big actors to participate in the system in a hopefully equal level. So this is well, some, some theoretical background about this. And yeah, of course, the idea is to use technology besides remote sensing, use, of course, all this big data, cloud technology, etc. So let's say this gives some meaning to the food security tab, and actually it has a meaning for us. Um, of course, when we sit here, we are very focused on agriculture and on agricultural applications, but uh, it's for a reason called food security tab, because this platform also should support national, international organizations or NGOs or whatever in um, yeah, deriving some information for their activities. So this is why it's a food security thematic exploitation platform, and of course, ESA are interested to if they, if they fund the development of this platform also that there's some outcome for this kind of food security questions. But on the other hand, um, it's an open platform, so everybody can use it, everybody can put the services on that, so it's of course a platform for science, for commercial applications, for whatever in agriculture, and besides that also in aquaculture, which I'm not talking about because I'm not a specialist, but there will be a link to, to a video in the end of this, so you can watch it and it will just show you quickly what is the aquaculture application that has been developed in the past year. So, so this is some more generic food for thought, I would say. Um, now I go to the technical things. Okay, I want to explain a little bit how this cloud basically works, or how clouds basically work, and how they interact in this ecosystem, and then go as an example to the food security platform. So typical applications in uh, agriculture could be, of course, I mean, the first thing that everybody is thinking about is about large-scale computing. Okay, so we have big data, a lot of data, so we want to compute that, pro pro process that. Okay. So this is, of course, a reasonable, a reasonable idea to use cloud computing, but it's not the only one. I mean, national scale, for example, monitoring, of course, you have this constant flow of information, systematic processing, and so on. And um, if you can probably also get rid of thinking about the technical issues because there's somebody else caring for your IT infrastructure, this could be helpful. But on the other hand, it's also a uh, Let's say for more for us, it's also important that you can really scale, for example, field scale applications. So even so, there may, might be small areas that so the compute time for this is very small, but you have access to all the data everywhere, basically, that you connect it first, of course, to your system. And then um, if it's on one day, it's just one field, you need to calculate, okay, that's fine. On the next day, it might be that you have a big thing, 10,000, and then you can also just quickly do that without any thinking. Inclusion of data available, that's an, of course a very important thing. We're talking a lot about open data and analysis ready data sets. So I think many of you have heard this, this buzzwords. And yeah, but this means that you need to be, let's say, if you have a standing service constantly connected to these kind of data sets. Of course you can do from your computer, but uh, if the data is out there, why not go out there as well and then you might be um, much better connected to this, to this information out there. And uh, this whole thing has also a human perspective. If you think about international collaboration, I mean, a cooperation, collaboration, yes, especially in development support, um, might be helpful to have the common workspace 
and not to transfer <laughs> between different, let's say, technical systems uh, between countries and so on. This could be helpful here. I mean, in the end, also, like the 21st century, we saw a lot of agile work environments. People go around, have switching uh, day times where they work and so on. So this could be also, I mean, just this is a very generic idea why to use that. And in the end, the distribution. If you go to a really remote area, I mean, the tr transfer of a large amount of data could be interrupted from time to time. Of course, you can do it. But why not keep the data in the cloud? So just the access to, to visualize the data and so on. This can be interrupted, and it can be just re restarted one minute later, and then it's already there. It's still there. It's no, no change to this. So this is ideas why go from not only to the big data, which the IT people and, of course, probably a lot of scientists, scientists think about, but also to some other reasons. So let's say typical features of these cloud platforms, of, chaos, of course, I mean, scalability. <coughs> scalability was what means that just this wording, if some of you have not heard it, um, just means that, of course, you can adjust your storage, your computing resources to what you actually need, your demand. And this can be very uh, different. And, of course, I mean, now with different Sentinels, I mean, I've heard about Sentinel-10 as in planning and so on. I mean, the amount of, uh, let alone Sentinel data, is growing that fast that you might see that this kind of demand that you have will even fluctuate even more than today. So just to give you an idea, just basically, it was uh, per day, yeah, per day um, storage for Lens, um, Landsat 5 was 45 gigabytes, Landsat 8, 400 gigabytes, and Sentinel 1 and 2 is already 4 terabytes, and there's 3 added and N and N, you know yourself better, so um, if you actually want to make use of that, the switch in demand will go on because not everybody is in the positive, in the nice way of just, okay, we do the same computing every day and we have al always a constant computing need. No, this is not the case. So I guess this is, at the moment, I was still like, like going on with uh, easily understandable things. I don't know who of you has saw this figure already. <laughs> Not so many, it seems. Um, this is a figure made by ESA about the, the ESA ecosystem, Space 4.0 ecosystem. And um, when you go around and explain what you're doing with your platform and so on, then people start saying, okay, you, there are so many platforms. So what is yours actually about? Yeah, and probably to, to explain this, um, you need to think about, I mean, you can argue if you like this figure but it's the most helpful thing I have at the moment to explain this. Um, the idea is, okay, the data generation layer, I guess most of us just clearly understand what this means. But then up there, the blue ones, there are different kinds of things that all are called platforms in the end. I mean, you can send to Agri, it's basically also a platform because you can put it on a Cray ideas and then it acts as a platform. There's the different thematic exploitation platforms, which are seven at the moment and some additional are are coming up, and then there are the DSs also often are called platform and so on. So the idea is here to say, okay, on the top of the data generation layer, um, Copernicus is funding the DSs. So at the moment there are four DSs. So this um, they mainly produce uh, provide data in the ICT infrastructure. Of course, they add also something to it. So they also becoming platforms, but in the, in the end, the basic idea is that the most, the main work they do is providing the ICT to the EO community and providing the Sentinel data and so on. So, and then from 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 a idea point of view, then there's the platform services layer where we are located, which actually means okay, there's the compute, there is the data, and now okay, there some of you are very good in let's say. Um, no, coding and uh, understanding what is actually going on there. But the platform layer should enable, let's say, the domain experts to use all of this with, let's say, 
standard tools that are that are state of the art in universities and companies and so on. So provide a layer where they actually the the users that the, the users that you do the exploitation, so they actually look for the data exploitation, they look how they can extract information that they can use the platforms. And so this is why there are seven platforms at the moment, but there's also another one coming up for the oil and gas industry and so on and so on. So these kind of platforms, they just, just enable you uh, to do this without uh, big knowledge of the underlying infrastructure and ICT components. And then, of course, and then what is always, I'm, I'm asking, of, of course, always, what is your services? I mean, the platform projects, they're mainly about building these platforms, of course. I mean, there should be some services as well on top of it. But the platforms, they provide everybody in the community with an opportunity to do, put their services up there. So, of course, also the consortia that are developing the platforms, of course, they're also involved. But basically, the exploitation of the data by methods, by e remote sensing methods, that is your part. I mean, you can do it for yourself. You can also then, like I will show, share it to another people and so on. And then on top, there's the actual end user that shall receive the information. For example, international organizations, well, for, and so on. So just to understand. So, and there's a lot of platform flying around here. So I guess this is quite wise, but of course, if you look for a longer time at it, <laughs> you start thinking about, does it make sense? And yeah, OK, then it's that discussion starts between the experts, of course. And um, then it's not only um, a vertical idea of layers, but it's also a horizontal idea in that, especially I know well in, in the platform services layer, all of this somehow interacts. So there are the seven semantic exploitation platforms. and. Um, the Proba VMAP, which were more singular platforms, and they, of course, should federate and work together somehow. But now there's also um, some common things. So this ecosystem, all these platforms grow together to an ecosystem. The data cube, there's the Euro data cube right now, European data cube facility for Earth observation, which will be available for all other thematic exploitation platforms and so on. So the, very good way to, to integrate data, but also to, to make data very fastly available. Um, the Open Earth Engine, I'm not so much into it at the moment, but also, like I said, identity management and stuff like that. So this is more to look at it that in two, three, five years, it will grow more to an ecosystem of where, okay, there's some focused specialization within this ecosystem of the different platforms, but it will be more like probably more like one the either platform ecosystem something like this don't don't ask me how it will look like because probably you need to ask somebody at ESA but this is something that is that is going on at the moment so I just want to give you an understanding that I'm not just marketing for the for our platform but I want you to give an idea about what's going on there so and if you yeah your question No, it doesn't work. I don't know. I'm Magdalena Nas. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> it works. <laughs> no, it doesn't. This one. <laughs> Thank you. Can you give us more information about the European Data Cube that you mentioned? Some more information? What do you mean with some more information? Uh, you just mentioned it. Yeah. Um, when it's expected to come, um, who is going to provide it? Like. Okay. Some yeah. No, so, okay. Information. Some more information. Yeah. So um, I just had a peek at it last week. So not that I really have an in-depth knowledge about it because it's quite new that it's now open. So um, basically, probably again, not all of the partners, but Synergize and uh, Brockman and, sorry, I forgot, work together and uh, it will be based on, on the Sentinel Hub and um, the X-Cube of Brockman. 
And um, the idea is that it's not only a storage place, data cube storage place, n dimensional storage place of data, whatever. No, uh, the idea is also that if you have, this is, I guess, why they also thought about the Sentinel Hub uh, background, that let's say simple computations that can be done on the Sentinel Hub can also be done for the European data cube. <coughs> so, um, the more complex analysis should be should be still on the exploitation platforms, but simple things like calculating a simple NDVI from not corrected data is, for example, something that you could do there. And um, <coughs> yeah, the timeline is short. I forgot, but I would say you sh in some months' time, like early next year, sh should see something. I mean, and then it will develop over time. So I think the first version, something like a year until the version one, but yeah. And the idea is as well that you have a virtual, you can probably use a virtual data cube, which doesn't mean you have to actually store all the data there but more like if you, if you want to extract information, then information for your area of interest, parameter time, and so on, will transfer to the processor, and it will be just um, processed on time. Because I wanted to say that a little bit later, but um, probably there's also a change of mind with working with cloud platforms, or in the cloud anyway. Compute is cheap, and storage is expensive. And usually if you're at your company or at home, it's the other way around. You pay a lot for the processors, and I mean, in the end, the storage, you can compress it and then archive it, and it can store it there for 10 years, and it doesn't cost you any more money, and it's the other way around in the cloud. But this is, um, yeah, I mean, there are ways now that to try to, to um, fix this problem a little bit, let's say. But on the other hand, if you, if you for example, have um, <coughs> releases all the time, you could probably keep up with your algorithms development over time and not just to store a big bunch of data and then see two years later, whoa, <laughs> we should reprocess all of this, you know, because it will be probably processed on time depending on what you do. So, but this is like, I'm this, I'm, no, I'm throwing around, thank you for the question, throwing around ideas, probably should get back to this. Yeah. So question concerning the So if the aim of the food security platform, uh, so food security is uh, depending on the scale, is tackling at the global scale or even more local? Because I think that, okay, we can optimize the use of nitrogen and so on, and we tackle a technical problem locally. <coughs> then the, we have to wonder if uh, optimized soya bean production in Brazil and Argentina is moving throughout the world is, mm. is wise or not and is uh, contributing to food security. Yeah, this is why what I tried to explain. Um, this actually depends if you're interested in that. Then find a service provider and you can co-work on it on the platform. <laughs> so, but basically, I mean, what I see most of the information that is derived is now based on Sentinel-2 and um, of course Sentinel-1 and so on. But so. Of course, this is always the option to say you can do it locally, you can do global applications. So, I mean, at the moment we see both of it. At the moment what you have as pilot applications are more focused towards um, farm level investigations, let's say. But in principle, I mean, this is probably something that takes a little bit more time to develop more this, this national or global scale applications. Um, because you might mo mostly do it once and try to try to integrate a lot of information and you ha also have to try to integrate the people that are working because they have specific needs for their global or national analysis. Okay. Um, ecosystem. Yeah, and there is, let's say, a start now the exploitation platforms, probably I haven't said that before, the, pl the first um, 
six thematic exploitation platforms started about five years ago, something like this. And we started a little bit later, about two years ago now. And, um, but of course, um, we all already started from ourselves federating in the cloud. But this should become even more easy in the future because there will be some more common architecture behind that in the future to grow to this ESA ecosystem. But at the moment, um, just the idea, like I said, the analysis ready data, for example, we take some from the coastal tab, we take some, some, some technical um, software infrastructure from Proba VMAP and so on. So it's always, the, so it's always important to think that these things grow and these things will also grow over time. So I mean, there will be more cooperation based on projects, based on, on let's say, larger um, consumers of data. So um, this, this is going on. And for example, we, this is something, of course, this is slowly going on because you need to really understand what the problems are. But for example, I mean, this probably might be not visible to the outside, but we're talking a lot with the World Food Program about this and um, to see that, yeah, there can be some, some exchange of knowledge and, of course, of information in the end. And that's all the same for all platforms, basically. If you look inside, so what is the, the basic idea is um, that inside this, for us, um, it's both on the one hand something that you can actually use. We call the open expert interface internally, but it doesn't matter. It just means that there is satellite data, there is ancillary data, processing power, and there are toolboxes which can be extended. It is not a fixed thing. I mean, we'll basically, we, the project will never stop. Development of the platform will never stop. There is no fixed end. Um, so this is something that you can actually use by yourself via graphical user interface, of course, API later on. And on the other hand, the idea is, okay, we as platform provider, it's not about so much about the actual information services, but service providers, and they can be public and, and private, this is not a, not a big issue if it's the one or the other. They can use the cloud, of course, to transform their information, uh, their algorithms into products for mobile visualization, direct, direct customized um, product um, delivery, and so on. So, this is the general idea, and this is what we have at the moment, basically. Yeah. So I didn't didn't, didn't want to demonstrate. Two hours, so this is why I took some time also to, to explain some things. I hope I'm not taking too much time, but um, probably I can get rid of this quite fast about this slide. So the, the very early idea was just to, to think about all the scalability and the big data. Long time ago, it's a very old slide. So it was ma mainly about direct access to data, pre-processing and so on. And this is really fixed. So at the moment, it's a processing platform and it was a graphic user interface and API, but as I explained, there's much more that developed over time and it will develop in the next years. So, but probably you will hear some things if you look into the cloud, cloud uh, thing a little bit more. I just want to, to let you know what are typical things like backbone and front end and all this as a service things. So give this, to give this a meaning, if you hear that later on. So what it basically means that such a structure has a backend or a backbone. Uh, backend, I think, is a classical way of saying this. That, um, for example, in our case, is a data and computing infrastructure. So data as a service and infrastructure as a service by Creodius. And together with some platform as a service, services from the Proba VMAP. So for example, what you can see in the end, we use the time series module, I say module because I'm old school guy, <laughs> from Proba VMAP. So we just use that. So the data is, for example, the pre-processing is done on the food security tab, but we use this kind of platform as a service because we're in the cloud. Then <clears throat> we also use some software as a service, uh, sorry, this is still the F tab. Sorry, I'm wrong here. The forestry tab. So, because 
the other tabs were older. We took some software components of open source components, of course, from the forestry tab. So there is some software as a service there already because it's now developed together. Um, and you see up there, yeah? And then in the end, what is actually what is you, you are interested about, or probably some of you are interested about, is the information as a service. So for example, um, we take the Copernicus Global Land Monitoring Services information and provide it through us officially or the co some coastal tab information. And so this all together is the backbone and then the front end just means the interaction with the actual interaction with the user. But we're trying to, to give you a good experience there because it's, we think it's not only uh, important to, do, to know how to do all the, the Python um, coding in the cloud, but also to, to make this more easy for, for you. So on top of that, there's the actual front end that what you see in your browser. And um, information as a service is provided by the analyst, which is a simple visualizer. We didn't put a lot of effort at that at the moment because we're trying to get the backbone and, uh, let's say, running on a very high efficient, highly efficiently level. And the customized services, which you get a peak with the pilot services. And uh, what you can use is the free for advanced users <clears throat> it's, yeah, it's free, so yeah, of course you need some IST budget, but basically it's free to use it, it's open to use it. The, the <coughs> graphical user interfaces and the API. By the way, there should be an a, uh, open API, a standard ESA API coming up, probably also a global Earth Observation API in a few years as well. So probably if you start thinking about that and learning about that in three years, you can use one API for all of the, hopefully, <coughs> globally or for all the platforms that you just have to learn one language and access all the data that is available. <laughs> yes. Sorry. <coughs> As I understand, yes, but of course, uh, a lot of that is always also uh, driven by OGC. So, um, as I'm not, I'm not that, that much a technical guy. So actually, an EO Open is very important with regard to this. But I think because they would, will need to involve OGC there. So actually, will what would be the driving force? I cannot say at the moment. Okay. Sorry, I have a short question. Yeah, of course. When you said customized services, uh, which are they aimed for? Which kind of public or users are these customized services? No, customized service just means that um, there is, let's say, a remote sensing specialist team on the one hand <clears throat> and somebody who needs information on the other hand, and you customize that service to somebody. And it does, without requirement, it just means that um, you can do public things on such a platform, you can do your private things because of course in situ data is involved and so on and so on. For example, uh, doing a crop type mapping with in situ data, okay, then this is maybe a standardized because now there's a tool for that. But it wasn't long, uh, for a long time, so it was, or it's still, it's still a customized service, I would say, and you can have specific um, users, but you need to interact with them because you need to probably do something. So, this is customized services just means at the moment, as you will see, for in our case, I guess for most of the platforms, the public standard pro standardized products are mostly vegetation indices somehow and stuff like that, because then you can be sure that there's a way of computing that globally without any interaction. Everything else is a little bit more sensitive. And there will be things coming up, of course, and I mean, but yeah. So then, then it's customized as soon as there's some, some interaction because of the customer. So, of course, this probably is uh, more because I 
I like to have some more, some more visual thing there, but <clears throat> of course, it's highly flexible workflows. Yeah, I think you, most of you understand what I mean, but again, some computing somewhere else in the cloud, some data from somewhere else in the cloud, but also your own data, for example, here. This can just be, just be integrated into what is computed. And um, what I will see, I mean, mostly there are some pre-processing steps. So you have this, for example, leaf area as an intermediary step, and then there's the actual information in the end. And the idea is also to provide in the cloud, or our idea to provide um, some orchestrator, some more generic orchestration, which we're working at at the moment, that will allow you to, to customize your workflows a little bit better not just doing it on yourself, by yourself on your own, but having a more generation, generic orchestration of workflows. Um, so for example, you can somehow pick your own preprocessor, plug it in there, define the event, when a higher level service is, is computed, for example, from your level two data, and stuff like that. So this is basically also the idea that we have that such a platform should ease also the development of, of workflows. Because why you should go there, I mean, of course, you can just take your algorithm and put it on the cloud because you want to save some money, okay? That's a nice thing. But on the other hand, uh, it should be also possible to have, yes, yeah, some, some additional functionalities that, that ease life by this. And it's, of course, you, there, there's the orchestration is there for, a lot, but this is why we take some time to do that, but we, we try to, to have some, some more generic orchestration where you can do you adjust yourself what you actually want to compute in the end. Yeah, of course. I mean, this is the standard, and why change the standard? <laughs> so you will see later on. Thank you for, for asking. Yeah, it was another slide, so I mean, I don't know about who does not know what Docker is. Just be honest. I mean, it's no problem. No, okay. <laughs> a few. Okay, a few. Okay. So probably I keep it to later on, but it's a very nice way of packaging your Linux algorithm and putting this package anywhere for, for compute. So, but I will, I will go into this a little bit later on. And actually, I wanted to show you our expert uh, user interface where you can do coding or put your algorithm uh, yourself. <clears throat> I'm talking quite long, so um, I skip this one. It's not that interesting and uh, go now to the example of the food security uh, thematic exploitation platform. Um, so just some buzzwords, what you actually can do when you use the user interface is, um, what did I write? Yeah, of course, explore the data and the services and so on. Um, then as soon as you're an expert user and all of you who have sent me requests for coins should be expert users, can um, yeah, develop your own services, means implement your own algorithm in your own Docker environment. And then also, I mean, you have your algorithms, so your service, you have probably processed products. Um, you can do your own collections, manage means, yeah, I can do some things, but also share. I mean, also the important thing I was mentioning in the beginning was that it should be a sh shared environment, such a cloud system. So it's, it's first, all, everything is your private stuff, but you just make a group and then you share stuff with your, with your colleagues very easily. And of course, it's a publication feature as well, but this is something that is more sensitive. Account management and analysis I will also tackle later on. So what I mentioned is, okay, so what is like, let's say, standard products? You can see here, I don't go into it a lot, but yes, of course, Snap is a standard and it's a good standard, by the way. And um, so there is some information, for example, yesterday I heard about the modified chlorophyll absorption ratio. I think that's, that's quite nice to have it there. But of course, this is quite generic. The important thing is much more that you can just press the button here, but um, you can also adjust, for example, this by just quickly opening up, putting your own graph, Sentinel-2 um, processing graph there, store and, and produce it, 
produce the results on parallel processing anywhere. So this is, let's say, for the developer, for the scientific point of view, um, the good things. Why is there better? So this is why um, we we have a, had a transformation of software in the past. So we will um, just put this online again. For example, the generic R processor is already there, but there was an issue. Uh, with the updating of, of um, the Linux software and libraries. And on the other hand, um, yeah, from an agricultural point of view, it's Vito from Belgium and Vista for us, we we're doing, let's say, the pilot applications as well, not only developing the platform, so there is something to, to see here. But it's really important, I guess, in this room to, to think about, you can do everything you want with some tools I will show you later on. There's also some complementary data for analysis, so there's some geo servers in the background that just serve the data, as long as you're on the platform, or if, as long as you have a token to access the platform also from your computer, you can, you can use this. And um, yeah, there's a little bit, I know a little bit more about that. There's some more difficult topics like soil maps, how to actually expose that in the cloud. But, this will, this will up come, coming up again soon. We actually focused a lot on the platform development in the first, first part of the, of the project and now we are more focused on data and services. <coughs> so typical tools that are there, you will probably have a peek at Jupyter of course, Snap and Qubis is there. It's for if you want to really do the classical work, you can uh, push the results into a Qubis application and look at it. Um, what we also want you to, to have soon is not only the R Studio, but also that you just can take your R scripts and run them in parallel on the input data. And yeah, of course, which, which is an important thing, and we will see what what happens in the future. But Sentinel to Agri, of course, should be in a food security platform as well which is, yeah, let's say under development, under discussion, but you will, you will see things like that because now, as it says, a certain maturity, you will see much more um, services coming up. Like you ask, it's based on, it's based on Docker. So um, this typical whale with the containers up there, that's the Docker sign and um, yeah, just to, to give you an example, of course, that it's quite easy to, to do your own algorithm, for example, what you need to do with regard to the input here is, of course, yeah, put your Linux environment algorithm there and it runs, but it needs to communicate a little bit with the platform, of course, and this, for example, looks like for a more simple pre-processing step here, like it just def define what is the actual input data, for, for example, Sentinel L1C, at you, L1C, and um, you just define your output collections. I will explain what the collections are later on. You can drag in the digital elevation model, for example, for the atmospheric, or for the correction step, and then you produce some outputs here. This is just an example from our first, um, from our surf first Docker service we had on the platform. So this is actually really, that's it. So if you have it already, it's no more than that to, to do this. And this, um, of course, is available to give you a peek also at the, uh, the analyst. So if you have a collection of data, which means basically usually it's a parameter that you put together, then you can also ask to get this as a collection in the analyst view to, to visualize it. For example, here, this is the the typical visualization we have at the moment. But um, all this visualization and mobile stuff, this is something that um, is also a second step because as, as long as there's no efficiently working and with a good orchestration and so on uh, platform, it's, it's no reason to actually invest a lot in visualization. There's also current documentation. You can read this from the slides, so I won't go into that. So I just think we just have a quite nice user manual, but it can be expanded. And before I talk much more, 
I will do a short demonstration. Okay. So if you successfully, let's see. Registered to, oh no, I, I cannot open the register page, of course, because I'm already logged in using SSO. But as you, as you just quickly could see, you direct it to register here, and it's quite simple. And then you can, if I log out here, Usually we'll get Oh sorry. No, I misspelled of course. So like this. So First of all, of course, the entry is now actually information is transferred from SSO to the platform. So the first thing is, of course, to, to see what, what's there. So satellite data, I don't have to explain, I guess. But you know, what you can see here, for example, is if you actually don't want to use um, web coverage service to access the ancillary data, the complementary data, you can, you can go through this and also the reference data, which you will need later on. So for example, I could have uploaded, and you all of you should see that later on, some data and shared it with you. So I can see my own reference data, but I'm now logged in with another user. So this is the simple way of sharing this. And then it can be searchable and then it can be used as an input. Of course, there are products, but it's more easy to, to look at them in the analyst view later on. And um, there's also additional things because we're talking about other culture. Of course, on the food security, things like the Copernicus Global Land Monitoring Service products, they are important as an information, already existing information. So you can see, for example, that here the 300 meter leaf area from the Copernicus Global Land products is there and there's a whole list of information that you can just use and what you can do, you can just use them and do a Docker container and work here for the next step of information. Then you can see what are the public services right now. So, which is, which is a number, and so it's quite, for example, let's say do something simple, the brightness index. Okay, you just really need to find some input, give the whole job a label, and you can run it, and you can easily run it on parallel. How does it work to, to run in parallel? For example, I look for Sentinel-1 data here. I either can put all of this data in a data basket. So I create a data basket. Oh, wait, it's a French keyboard. <laughs> That's really different. <laughs> why, why you switch the numbers in the special sign? Okay, this is the new, word, the new style, of course, as well, yeah. And stuff like this. <laughs> so, so for example, I just created my data basket and I just can put all of the search results into test one, which is probably too much because I just took an AOI. I want to explain a little bit about this, about this interface a little bit later. 
but for example, I can choose these three tiles and add the selected <laughs> items. I always forget myself. Add the selected items to this data basket. Of course, there are some more sophisticated ways because you can see for the Sentinel product date and define your AOI a little bit more sensitive than I did. But you can store that. And um, for example, you could also say, okay, there's somebody who's just doing the research in that area and he created a data basket. For example, this user, I just now created a data basket test one containing four files like this. And if, if I don't have any idea, but I just pass it on to my colleague saying, okay, I want to share you this. I, for example, share this with the group I'm belonging to, the food security tab demo group of today with yeah, you can add something if you think about it and share it and it's done. And I can also take this one, this one data basket in the Explorer, go to the Services tab, select the Brightness Index, I should get this one again, find my data baskets. And now I just push this data basket, or of course a single file there, give the baby a name, and the four, four scenes will run in parallel and will be there like yeah, half an hour or something like that. And of course you can scale. So this, this is basically the idea to, to make it user friendly and um, to also to, let, like I said, let, let everybody use this. How much you can do and what, you, what you're allowed to do, you can see, of course, in the account information. So I have, for example, at the moment, if I just start blankly, I can just run five jobs in parallel. I have some file storage attached, but I can also see what I was, what I was doing here used by the usage reports. Um, I was often, quite often asked, okay, how can I personally use it? Is there a way for, for just paying a euro and then having, having a result? Actually, no, unfortunately not, because the SSO system, of course, doesn't uh, provide any functionality to, to allow online marketing. So this is not possible like that. But on the other hand, of course, the good thing is that, let's say, all platforms provide some, some first user accounts where you can just do something. And in our case, it's we, we still have some, some, some budget left. You can also say, okay, I have this small project for my master thesis, whatever, and I want to compute a little bit more. I do want to do something and ask for this early adopter program that I'm also uh, advertising. But in the end, we are connected, especially for the research, it, it will be very easy because there's the is a network of resources. There's the um, Horizon 2020 Ochre program, which easily provides um, funding of cloud um, platforms, of actually also of Earth observation products for the research community. So if you're from the research community, it will in the end be very easy to get some, some funding to, to use yeah, any of the ESA platforms, basically. And also the DS resources, yes? But the best, very short question. Probably here in the middle, it's better than. When you click the uh, Copernicus London Monitoring Service, the products, I didn't see the high resolution layer. Like the impervious near urban atlas is not there. It's a global, Copernicus Global Land Monitoring no Service. No, Pan Europe. It's, uh, pan, it's a Pan Europe product. It's all your, it's Europe wide uh, product, but no, it's not in your in the uh, this. Uh, no, this is just uh, the the global land service data. Oh, okay, just. This is just the global land service oh. data. Because this is also provided by collaboration or like federation with the Proba V, 
mission exploitation platform. And um, of course, the Prober V is used for, for the, the global products here. And so the standard resolution that is, that is provided is 300 meters raster resolution. Yes? Can you speak up or do you need a I microphone? Can, I can speak up, yeah. Like, uh, I'm still fuzzy, still fuzzy in my mind, like uh, the mechanism in terms of the usage mm -hmm. of the platform. Like, uh, because we need to register, we need to ask for those coins. Uh, on a daily basis, how, how, how that thing is going to work? Like, I mean, is it like a, a payable service or... Perhaps I didn't do my, my Well, okay, yeah, and no, 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 I probably, I was going over that too fast. So, with regard to this, there, I need to go away from them, too, too close. Um, with regard to this, there is two options. If you think about commercial use, I mean, if you think about bigger style, then, of course, you can contact us and we just see, but... Um, there will be no on-demand service, no click and go. So this will, not now. I mean, this will be because there's the authentication service as a marketplace coming up in the future. So I don't know how long that will take. Probably one, two years. Yeah. Then this will change a lot for all platforms. Yes, but then let's say I'm a scientist from. A but if you're a scientist, and, and I want to use the, the thing. if you just want to have a peek, then just ask us. If you want to have something more, then apply for the either EO network of resources. It's not that much advertised because it's still building up. So actually, we need to. So, so then you can just. Have we a no no wait a second. <clears throat> Sorry, I was just interrupted because of this. Um, the either network of resources means they provide funding to use the platforms for research, and you just. Apply just apply for your project. You need to okay. You need to have a project work on that. But you can say okay. I want to use the platforms for that and that project work over that time, for one year, for example. And then you will get a price. Oh no, we will have a price list before, but the price list is not f fixed at the moment. But it will be this year for sure. Um, and then you can look it up and say, okay, I want to use the coastal tab for that and that and that, or I want just the standard service package to use that. So let's say all PhD students can just go there, okay? Yeah. This, whatever, something like this. And um, then you can say, okay, this is the price list and this is why I ask for 10,000 euros, whatever, for the network of resources for your scientific work. Okay, but then one needs to have really clear the potential of the tool or what can be done there, right? I mean, if I submit this request, I'm going to need to to send you a concept note, let's say. Look, I want to do that, 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 that. And so I need to have really clear on the potential of the, of the platform, right? Yeah, of course. But I mean, just logging in with the SSO, you can, you can easily do without any cost. Explore a little bit. Okay. Yeah, of course. And okay. if you want to know a little bit more, you can you can ask for some early adopter coins. I mean, I provided you 50, which is not too much, honestly. But uh, okay, if you say, okay, we need to do a little bit, we want to investigate something or actually do a compute. <laughs> this is this start, starting thing because I mean, especially as long as the platforms are supported, and of course, first give and then take. And if you want bigger chunk of money, then you could also ask your research institution. Because uh, to explain, there is not only this ESA network of resources, which is quite a fast way to, to, to get resources for your projects, but there's also the Horizon 2020 open cloud of research environments, OCR project, and they more directly provide funding to institutions to use, to use clouds. So, and institutions could apply for that via their national research uh, councils and so on. And, um, Now, if, yeah, if, if you're interested in your own IP rights, that's probably an important question. 
um, it's your IP still because your algorithm is enclosed in your Docker container and you own a Docker container. And if you want to share it with your colleagues, that's your choice. And you can uh, attach a price tag to it as well. So we are absolutely aware. I mean, I can give you the theoretical description of the business model, which is not there already, but like I said, with a, with a new authentication system and so on, this will enable us and also the network of resources and will enable a little bit of this. And um, so actually it's yours. That's why I meant that we, we are focusing on the platform itself to give you a good experience both as a developer service provider um, as well as a user of data. It's, first of all, it's confidential. And everything what you produce, I should want it to go now to the collections. Everything you produce, if you generate your own collection of data, so your own basket, virtual basket, if you put it in there, it's just visible to those that have, you have shared it. Or you can also ask for publication, so we think about more commercial things or for example, having a scientific standard, you think, okay, this should be a scientific standard, I want to make it public to everybody. Then you can, you can ask uh, the platform operations to make it public. They will just have a look if it sounds reasonable what you want to publish, not to have everything published. And then it can be public and it can attach the price tag. So for example, if, like for now, for, for now we, for example, we just charge one coin for, for snap processings because they don't take a lot of time and it's not our IP, so you just should pay the, the compute time. Um, but then you can say you have something much more interesting, more complicated and so on. It, you can just say, okay, this will just have a one-off cost of 10 coins and you now will ask how much 10 coins are in euros. <laughs> but this really depends on the billing system. <laughs> so what we can actually bill. So, uh, but I, the price list should be out end of the year, and then the tabs, uh, tab coins will have a meaning for all platforms, not only for us, but also for all platforms. And the research is subject on Visa to decide if they sponsor your analysis or not. Is it? Your, uh, your analysis. For research purpose, I mean. Yes. It's subject to Visa to decide. It's subject to Visa. No, no, we don't decide about scientific projects, so. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. So the only thing you can look for free is visualize. Visualize. visualize the tool, for instance, the, the process, the brightening index that you were starting to do. Also this, we should have coins to do this. Also yeah, you have already 50 coins. Okay. So you can produce 50 scenes of brightness index. Okay. Yeah. But if you want to download them, then you also need to reserve at the moment 25 for downloading and 25 for processing. But as I said, at the moment it's really very a virtual thing. So um, it's no problem to, to give it some more to a certain extent. Especially if it's known that it's scientific use. So. Yeah. Uh, I was just playing around. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you're talking, yeah, probably I should pass the microphone to somebody really understanding Sentinel-1 data. <laughs> no, but it's just the different production levels. Uh, wait a second, you... So... So, here's the product type, it's a little bit lower here. Joe. Yeah, but I, sorry, I really never touched radar processing, so. <laughs> yeah, well, the standards I, of the platform is the standards for Visa. Yeah, 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 it's the same, same, same naming. Yeah. Just look it up in the Sentinel-1 yeah. documentation. Um, yeah, like I said, yeah, oh. Go ahead, go ahead. 
Now, like I said, I wanted to show you what, what does it mean with collections. So the manage and share uh, tab, I think, is one of the most important things. So you, of course, always can, can add something yourself. It doesn't matter how influential you are on the platform. It's just for you, so create a new group. Um, but what I said here with regard to data security, um, okay, this one user doesn't, uh, doesn't have a new collection, but if I create a new collection, this collection, okay, name and so on, this is not so interesting. You can also define a file type, which is uh, basically output product with reference data. So one thing is produced on the platform, the other thing is uploaded to the platform. So this is basically the general distinction uh, with management. You have it there and then it's really just your own. For example, Whatever, I don't care. Huh? I created this. Did I miss something? Or is it just slow? You're also waiting. Yeah, it's, yeah, I think everyone is trying to do something, so the system. <laughs> now we did a testing of the front end, so basically the system should yeah, should take care of 50 users, so this is no problem. So when you when you go here, like I said, this one this is actually this is actually um, these are the snap processors. So in the, ba the back there's a Linux running snap, and there's just the input and output uh, parameters transferred between the platform and this little snap environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is what this is the difficult, but this is the difficult part because if you do something as a public service uh, on the platform, it should be very much standardized. Yeah, no, but the, so it's quite makes sense using this yeah. comment because actually the food security platform. But so far, what you are showing is EO products. The idea of manipulating, the idea of data analytics yeah. is on the yeah. cloud. So what? In terms of food security, because the term of food security is quite strong. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? <laughs> <laughs> can, can you tell yeah. what's it's the difference between what we saw with Snap or Sentinel 2? Yeah, exactly. what, why, as a user, I should go there rather than the other? Well, I know that I will have a little yeah, yeah, yeah. here. But who are you targeting? Small companies that cannot afford to process the data or to access the data? No, there are two things we're targeting. On the one hand, yeah, on the one hand we're targeting, um, of course, scientific users. And you actually, this is what I meant in the beginning. You, you're asking about the services, about the food security information services. But we were shown other systems, so now I have to Yeah, yeah. No, it is a, now you don't have to. You don't have actually. You don't actually need to to do a choice. That's the the problem. So because you can you can build upon here. So of course, I mean, if you talk about Snap, if you talk about Send to Agri, that's you can also do it on your own, of course. But if you want to take advantage of connecting in the cloud. 
to other information to build user orchestrator, build your own stuff on top of, for example, Snap. This is this, let's say, the technical point of view. With regard to food security specific information services, um, yes, there will be crop type mapping, there will be monitoring services, there will be irrigation mapping without using Centro Agri and so on, so like only based on some other algorithms. This will be now upcoming, but this is something that is developed now in this scale where it's relevant for food security with specific users. So, I mean, we're in contact with, with some governments with the World Food Program and so on to, to actually set it up. And this will spread out services in the end to the platform. So this is always the, the worst question to say, and you will see, I mean, I'm just going to the services right now. So, but it's not, actually, it's not that easily published, uh, public. That's why we say about the customized services. We need to probably advertise this better. This could be. But we actually were asked also to, as always, if you, if you say this is, this is open, yes, it's, the platform itself is open, but um, you don't have to ask me why a service is customized or why it's public and widely available. It's not so much about keeping it on your own because you will, you will see a little bit it's not some things have been in the beginning have been quite simple. But it's more about the, the adjustment of services that is, that is needed. Yeah, with regard to food security, of course. That's, that's your target, That's one target. No, I mean, what, what is my target as a platform lead is to, to see that all, uh, com the whole community can somehow be, can somehow be there. And uh, with regard to the, I mean, we're asked, no, no, wait, wait, wait yeah, I know, should, you know why, why should I go there? That's a good question. I can tell you if we have, uh, we're trying to get a good user experience with regard to the platform. And like I said, I need to, I need to bring the services online, but I'm not doing the services, you know. So there's a difference, probably the, the deep difference between something like Centro Agri, which is actually developing this information service. And this one is providing platform services to Yes, it's absolutely I limited. To, I need to, to be screened. Yeah, be around. Be screened to, to be able to use the thing. So then actually, that's why I said like if you are for majority targeting like international organizations that are going to use these in you know, this regional or country scale or food security purpose, let's say. But so, and what they're going to do, then it's a food security Yeah, but it's, uh, what, what is also the, the idea, what, uh, what is behind it, it, of course, it should be a meeting point for the respective community. So if you go to the geohazards tab, it's the meeting point of the geohazards community. And then the and, um, going to need to pay for using the, the system itself, isn't it? Like, let's say I, I'm UN and I have a, a project. <coughs> I see I can use this, your platform. I'm going to need you. Yeah, but if you, if you ask for this service by somebody, you always have to pay. So this is... I mean, of course, you can say everything should be free and open, of course, but the question is, uh, if you have no uh, research budget, you need to something to live for, yes? So, um, yes, but it's basically, if you want information, it's a way of enabling this like I said, to, to bring this in the ESA ecosystem. And um, I would just advise you to, to have our newsletter and we will see in the next uh, two, four months to, to see more about services. Yes. Because it's, uh, at the, it's a little bit, it's probably more project related, but um, now, now we're at the way where we 
let's say, fix some, some, some users and that's in the end will lead to services because services will provide it to users. And um, with regard to standardized public services, that's, that's a difficult thing. I mean, if you look at the most platforms, I mean, what everybody can do is some producing some, some indices, whatever, because this is kind of the simplest way of standardizing it. Everything else is a little bit sensitive. And people are thinking about it, and I mean, there's good things that like, like methods, like, like employed and sent to Akron. So, I mean, they, they become standards. That's good. But uh, let's say as a single player, providing a standard is a little bit more difficult. Yeah. Yes? Definitely. I mean, what, what will be there soon is um, some, some change detection algorithm and then something to build upon. I'm, again, no specialist in the exact application with low-cost detection and so on, but we are working together with the team, again, from Proba VMAP, because that's the, the closest connection we have at the moment, to combine both medium resolution and high resolution information to do that, for example, and of course. And I mean, we will do that, of course, also because there has been interest to do this, of course, yeah. So, drought monitoring, low-cost monitoring, these are things that, and then if it's there and it's, let's say, it's, it's used by public service, it's funded by a public service, this should also spread out. Yeah, also to justify the name, no? Yeah. Huh? Also for justifying the name. Yeah, yeah, of course, no, no, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's a I have a hard time on this because it's, it's a slow process. Absolutely. I'm right. So besides that, um, I just invite you, I mean, if this is, could be one of your entry points to the ESA platform world, and now also now in this, with this respect here in this room, just advise you to, to have a look. And if you go somewhere else, that's, that's fine for me personally. Um, I understand that it's mo mostly based on information, but in the end, you have to also think about it will grow together. So probably you can also choose by how, how yeah, user experience, how you would say, software development. So it will, won't be restricted to one platform. Time is over that you're restricted to one platform. It will be quite easy to switch. There has been a break in the network, I guess. <coughs> yeah, I think so. Thanks. Of course. So these packages or modules that we have here at those specific applications in agriculture, are they developed by you or by the community that's here in the platform? I mean, it's a no. cooperative thing or just you develop them and then you choose the one you want to use and then you run it on your data? No, okay. We cannot see anything at the moment, but uh, probably i just go back here quickly switched over it. Um, yeah. So on the one hand, this is community thing on the left, so public processing services. And of course, because is, this is basis for service pilots that we're actually doing on the right side, this is like IP protected. As you could, yeah, if Vito is really <laughs> under IPR, let's, let's uh, look at it a different way. But this are, let's say, that's this just shared processing services and owned by two. I mean, Hatfield is a little bit more complicated with their, with their processing. So, but, and of course, this you can add up this list. So this is owned. But if you want to do it public, like I explained, 
then uh, you can just say, okay, I ask to make this public because I'm from this, this organization, this is that, that and that algorithm, and then it's no, no problem, probably won't even be asked, but there is some, some, some checking or publication. So in the end, it's, and then you, yeah, like I said, there will be um, also the options to, do, to use under standardized tools, standardized tools there. And this will be, of course, very much more focused on um, the food part. And also the aquaculture part, which is quite interesting to, to investigate for me because I don't know anything about it. Yes. If I'm going to uh, write some new uh, container and new algorithm and mm. integrate, want to integrate it, what's the API in between? So you are standardizing also the interfaces within the system so that you can orchestrate new things, new uh, processing Yeah, chains. probably. I mean, I'm, I see that we already still have a lot more <laughs> down here. So probably, um, a second, try to get this running. Now in case not, probably um, it's, it's more easy than that to explain. The standardization is really easy because the container has some clear input output parameters and that you can define and this defines the interaction and there's a reference so this is a list you can just put on a list of things you want to exchange between the platform and your in the container and um, yeah you kind of free to it I mean some things like input output files they need to, to have some specific uh, coding in this mm -hmm. input list but it's quite easy I just thought probably I could just show it right now but This should not happen. We actually did a test run, so okay. Yeah, probably is really the first time that I mean there are some some additional users likely logged on that we have this this load, but I would not have thought about it. So I give, you, I give you an example of, of higher level services with some orchestration that we think of because it's still under development. But for example, we have this um, kind of field scale nitrogen uptake service we, we did as a simple pilot in the very early to see how, how it's working. So um, just to give you a quick understanding of the background is that winter oil rapeseed which is the correct naming, I guess. Um, there is a fertilization event quite, quite early in, in Germany, usually in March, something like this, so probably April. I, I'm not an agronomist. But um, the important thing about this is that you would like to know, okay, from the precision farming point of view, what is the nitrogen uptake over winter? It started to grow in, uh, in fall and how much nitrogen has been taken away from the, from the soil. Um, the nitrogen uptake here, you can, you can do complex things. We had a wonderful uh, talk about it yesterday, of course. So I'm not tackling this because it's, it's not focused on that. But what we did, for example, was to show, and that is something that you can also quickly do, uh, is to open up a Docker container, extract the information, or you can just also just take send, complete Sentinel-2 scenes, or you can extract the information, um, and then compute a very simple, algorithm here, which um, is based, of course, on green biomass. So the end uptake is green biomass times something. 
And we just looked at it and saw that, that in France, it seems to be that there is some, some empirical um, equation that basically says the reglet azot colza seems to be used since the 80s. I'm not French, but this is what French people also told it as symposia. And so this is quite simple. So you use the biomass and time 65 to, to do the actual fertilization. If you look a little bit more into the details about the specific leaf weight and then affect the, effectively the leaf area, you can compute that. And the important thing about this, this is that I just said, okay, during winter, some of the leaves, leaves are again dropped, of course. They have been growing in fall and then are, they are dropped through winter, depending on, on the cold, on the freezing. And, but about half of these leaves are remineralized in spring. So basically it's quite simple just to do an average of these two, the highest LIE maximum in, in fall and the lowest leaf area in, in spring. And then you calculate the nitrogen uptake by that. It works quite well. We actually delivered that product in another context, but uh, so it works quite well. And it's also like, I mean, it's, it's used by, by, by farmers already in the past. So, and I wanted to show you on this example how this works with a Docker environment. Here it is, the slide. I go back to, go back to this. And um, I should have pushed everything uh, now in the slide. What, what is going on here, this looks like. So you actually don't need to, to open up the command line and um, think about it, but it's actually documented here that on the one hand you have the files. Okay, what a Docker file is, I mean, there are some templates that provide it to you, so you don't have to worry a lot about it. But then you have, for example, here your workflow, your Linux workflow, <laughs> and it's actually really just like, like using it. And um, you can attach some more you can attach some more data to your algorithm by using user mounts. Yes? So are you free to take your own Docker image or Docker file? No, it, it's, it's not like that flexible that you just have the Docker image and transfer it because, it, like I said, it was meant to be a platform for non-specialized users, for domain experts, more like if you have loads of soil, economic background, whatever. So it's not like that, but if you can just copy and paste the relevant uh, Docker file and workflow here, try to, I try to show. Oh God. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. No. So where's my error? So, um, yeah, you can just copy and paste what you did on your Linux computer right here and build it. And um, to define the, the, the action with a platform, I, you can just mount your own data, for example, here. Okay, this is like a typical thing, mount, mount a Linux drive. And um, with the input definitions, this is something where you can define the inputs of the user. For example, the year which you want to investigate or whatever, the input files that can be dropped in. For example, um, shapes for UAUI and, uh, and TIFFs for, for, for input, for, for a normal input. And then the output. The output definition is especially important because this is something that is really transferred out of the platform. It will receive a URL and it can be stored in a collection or like, let's say, in the public data space. So this is everything you need to know and yeah, I would really love to, love to show that, but uh, I'm not able, but I guess from this point of view, it's, it's very easy. And then on the other, other hand, if you at the, moment, at the beginning just can scale for five, um, five uh, parallel machines, this is probably not too much, but it's easy to, to let you scale if you have larger investigations. So if you want to, for, I mean, it's already too late, but if you want to follow this practical session that I'm thinking of, then you can follow here the slides. 
So the idea was to show you that um, you can also use AI files easily just by uploading them. Um, if you follow here, you can, for example, if you search for data, you can just import a shape file and then, then um, import the uh, search for Sentinel data by this way. Explore the biophysical parameter collections, which is the same as the Sentinel data, which I already showed. You can open up a collection I tried to show as well. And then you can generate your own service. And what you can do is, like you see here, you can do use templates so you don't actually have to care if you just want some Python algorithm working on um, an AOI. You can use, for example, this EO product web coverage service template and then work on from that point, uh, just putting in basically your whatever algorithm is actually working on the data. I mean, of course, you need to understand the input and output a little bit, but that's not more than 10 lines in the beginning and in the end. So it's not too, too much to understand about. So this is from the developer or scientific point of view. Let's say they are an easy way to, to get, get started. So this is what I wanted to say. Okay, so here there's the way, for example, then there's a bit quite of simple. You have this uh, time series of Sentinel-2 leaf area data extracted for an AOI in this case. It should have, should have worked, but now because of time, I don't try anymore. And then you can just think about how you work with this different TIFF data and then get an output. And it's, that's it. Yes? You have to press the mute button, I guess. Okay, no, no, it's okay. Uh, here you only has, I think this is a uh, web catalog of services, no? Where's the web feature services? You mentioned it before in the slides, you have. Oh, yeah, it's a basically, yeah, sorry, this is probably the name. The naming is a little bit uh, misleading. You need to, first it asks a web coverage, uh, web catalog service about what is available as features and then it's downloaded or it's, it's extracted as features by the WFS. So, yes, sorry. Okay. Yeah, should have been a short break. <laughs> you. No, we are, we are actually not directly. I think I will cut a lot. But I want to give you also a peek, let's say, in more um, advanced pilots that we did rerunning. And I will just take a few minutes. You can, you can uh, investigate yourself. And actually, I'm, I'm quite sad that originally a colleague from Vito should be here to present their service pilot. So now it's late and it's also not my work. So I will just quickly give you an idea what it was about. And I would also like to direct you in the end to, to the aquaculture service pilot, which is quite interesting. And they actually did a digital poster for free week last week, which is a short video which quite nicely shows and explains what, what they did. And um, so I would just direct you to that in the end. So I probably will take another 10 minutes to give you an idea. Um, what, what was the idea to do here, where's the nice view? I don't, like, like this. So what, um, what the background of the ongoing uh, Vito pilot is, we're focusing on Africa in the second phase of pilots, is um, of course because of the food security theme, is um, microfinancing. And uh, we are working together with a company in Kenya, which is, let's say, a little bit more wild process but uh, Vito has, let's say, longer experience to work with the World Food Program also in this respect. And what they, what they investigated in Kenya here, together with Pula Advisors, a local company, is what would be better for, for um, micro-insurance payouts to, to use 
for them, people that implement it there, and as well for people receiving it so they better understand what they, why they actually get payouts or not. So what they did is, on the one hand, they had weather-based indices, and on the other hand, aerial yield indices. And actually, they found out that the aerial yield indices were much more better taken up than just the weather-based indices, because, of course, this is much more close to what is actually has grown and why you pay, get an insurance paid and why not. And so this pooler advisors that, that are doing, actually doing the field work and also working on that for the World Food Program and for the R4 initiative that's behind that is that, okay, to get this area yield index for the payouts, of course, they define certain areas by counties or probably also by, by farmers group, which they're now working on to probably put farmers into a group is much better with regard to, to the physical geography, with regard to what they actually do, then it's probably better than just taking counties. And um, of course they have to, similar to the, of course similar to the, um, to the cap control, they have to go to fields and understand, but the problem is it's not like that easy like with the cap control because they have very small fields, they have mixed cropping, so it's actually you have to go there still. But of course now the pool advisors, they want to reduce cost. And this is why they, they brought in the idea of using remote sensing. And uh, Vito is working on that. And um, to say, okay, if I have fields that are very similar spectrally or with regard to time series of FAPA and EVI and so on, you probably have to visit just one field of these that are very similar with regard to time series and, and, and spectral. And um, so this is what they're actually doing right now um, to reduce just the amount because, because the unit costs are very low and of course the insurances and the microcredits also are experienced there. I mean it's about some euros that they actually is the payout. So of course 92% of the unit cost is just going to the fields which is way too high to make this uh, sustainable service which is running on its own, of course, not only funded by WFP. And um, so they worked on it. And what they do is they use the Python notebook application. Okay, a little bit more complicated, but what you got or what you get, but actually they do a time series analysis with a smoothing and um, analyze for different, for different parameters. And in the end, what they do is this kind of regional analysis. So to say, okay, they really pick the single fields and look at that spectrally with the Sentinel-2 data. Um, FAPA seems to be the most promising candidate with regard to vegetation index. And then there's a question about, okay, you try to get some, some, some um, uh, time timely component or just the maximum or the integral of the far power, but so I don't want to talk about that. But that's basically the idea. And of course, as you, as you understand, I mean, the similarity of, of the time series of far power, for example, this is really something that, that makes big sense because if the mixed cropping is similar, the soils are similar, um, then you can also argue about this. This might be, might be very close. It, it's enough to, to visit one of these farmers. And um, the slides will direct you to, to both Terrascope and Food Security tab, where you can find this Python notebook, which is basically, I mean, I was not here on Wednesday, unfortunately. So probably it's already some basically known, this kind of notebook, of course, time series extraction. But the nice thing about that one is that it uses the, um, the time series tool of the Proba V map, where both from the food security tab, Sentinel data is coming, process Sentinel data is coming in, and also what they do in the Proba V map, of course. So it's possible to access quite a lot of data, but it's a little bit more complicated if you want to actually make use of it in your own things, then in this case, uh, the V2 people will be the ones that can, can explain the use. But the important thing is that we now have the connection here, and we have this platform services actually from, from Terrascope, from Proba VMAP, as well available on the food security tab.
And the final thing is um, to, if you, if you go on our website, I think, as I said, this was just very new, this video, it really nicely explains um, the EO mangrove algorithm that was developed by, by Hatfield Consultants, our aquacultural partners uh, in Africa, but it's, will be, it's actually a nice standardized product they plan to, to, to extend this EO mangrove algorithm globally, especially to, to Asia. So um, this is a very nice application that they have been working on for some time already. And this is now <coughs> possible to, to actually employ this globally because of the use of, of cloud computing. So now, thank you very much again. Probably the applause in this case to our partners. Thank you very much. Question? Yeah, um, um, I, can, I understand that you cannot yet give um, details about the pricing, but um, do you think that given the nature of this project that public money is involved, etc., do you think that you can provide um, services for cheaper than private um, cloud, cloud uh, processing services? Cheaper than private um, providers? Like, let's say one day Google Earth will charge for this, uh, yeah, engine yeah, yeah. will charge for services. <laughs> I mean, um, that would be an advantage of using this platform rather, I mean, and besides other advantages, yeah. rather than using a private pro uh, cloud computing provider. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is, this is hard to predict actually, but thank you for the question. Uh, besides the, let's say, political, moral reason, whatever, to use whatever, um, I think it's, it's worthwhile to think about this because as long as there is no um, heterogeneous system of clouds, then it will likely be end up in one price for all, let's say. <laughs> But uh, I guess we can compete because of the funding, as you said, for, for some time and for sure. I guess from what I see, the actual computing resources, this levels out in the end. I mean, of course, uh, Google, for example, I mean, they are funding themselves this kind of services um, because they're big enough. But uh, on the other hand, if you just look at the ICT, then it's the same everywhere, basically. It's just a question of the business model. And the business model is, okay, we want a European ecosystem and this, this um, should support the European or whatever global science, then it will be for sure be competitive. So it's, it's still competitive. I mean, of course, if you just, it's an issue, if you're just a single researcher doing little things, everything is for free on the big platforms, of course, but let's say if you go a little bit larger scale, I guess um, it's absolutely competitive. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>